It was apparent during the 1930s that there was going to be a new world war. Nationalism was too strong. It was really looking pretty grim over in Europe. Hitler had all of Western Europe capture or Nazis. Japan starts expanding into China and wants to take over all of East Asia. Now, there's an Alaska piece of this that's really, really interesting. I came to Alaska when I was five. It was depression. My dad had three little girls, and a wife and a mother-in-law. And uh, his good friend in Juneau said, Clarence, come to Alaska. There's no depression here. Well, I was born in Stockton, California. We moved to San Francisco when I was three. But it was depression times, and we spent more time moving in and out of houses. Couldn't pay your rent, they put you out on the sidewalk. As part of War Plan Orange, the Navy says Panama is well fortified, Hawaii is well fortified, Alaska's got a peacetime garrison dating from the gold rush at the Chil Chilkoot Barracks in Haines. So they made Alaska one of the top priorities. The Navy has set up a, a perimeter that you can patrol with, with surface craft, submarines, and, and aircraft so that you can intercept any enemy force before it approaches U.S. mainland. The Navy planning board said, we need uh, naval air stations in Sitka and then Kodiak, and a third one in Dutch Harbor. So the fortification of Alaska begins in 1940, and the first place it gets fortified is Sitka, with a big naval base. So we came up in Sitka because it was beginning to grow a little bit. It was a very small town, very few cars then. The start of my childhood, as far as I'm concerned, is in 1941. Uncle Jack wrote and said, brother, there's lots of work up here, and it's paying a lot more than you're getting down there. He came over here, his family came over here for jobs during the war, before the war started. From Juneau? From Juneau, yeah. My dad is a commercial fisherman. In August, that is the fishing season, and my dad and mom both worked at the, at the cannery. They told me that the doctor they had was in the Pioneer home, and that might have been where I was born. And I was uh, 15. No, I was 16. Yeah. Practically an old woman. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> we had a little bit of money, enough to get up to Seattle, and enough for Dad to pay for the ticket on the ship that we were going on, but we had no money for food. So we had to borrow a hundred dollars in order to eat on the way up to Sitka. And of course I was going to school, but I was engaged because we had been going together and he gave me a ring before he came to Sitka. My dad went into construction business and then he decided we should homestead out to this road, Albert Point Road. And so every Sunday he'd be falling logs and we girls would be peeling them and uh, get them ready for the log cabin we were building. Took rocks from the beach and made a fireplace and made a stairway up to a loft for us to all sleep. Very primitive, no running water. My sister and I every morning was tasked to go down and get water from the creek and bring it back in two big buckets. I finished high school in 1940. We were inducted in the federal service. I was a member of the California National Guard, the 250th Coast Artillery. And in 1941, I came to Alaska on a Navy transport right out of San Francisco. But it was kind of amusing. We were on the ship uh, uh, out here where the tour boats usually land, and we could see cars driving along, and somebody says, they have cars in Sitka. We didn't know what we were going to get into. One of the other things that happened just before the war, one of my relatives had owned property on Eureka Island, got moved off. They browbeat him. They paid him, but they only paid him $500 for the property. And, but he had title to that island property. They moved him off, and to date, we still haven't been able to get it back. They wanted to know how a native got to own property.
living a happy, very quiet life. And all of a sudden, I was aware that there was a different aura about things that were going on. And they said we had to be out of the home, on, we homesteaded out, out because they wanted that road for the military. I think we had a week to move out. The five of us got into a two-bedroom apartment, but I thought it was uptown. It was great. There was a fear that there was going to be a war and the Japanese would come to Alaska. So my oldest sister was ready for college at that time. So my grandmother, Mary Whittemore, was taking her down. My mom thought I should go too. So I remember I had either seventh or eighth grade in Corvallis, Oregon. They had a couple of uh, a thousand troops here at that stage of the game. The Navy and the Army were ramping up and building a tremendous amount of things. Dad then ended up working right away, documenting all the freight that was coming in on the ships. It created a lot of jobs for a lot of the, the natives, because we were natural carpenters. We were always building. The ships were coming in with, with all kinds of building materials, all kinds of weapons, all kinds of ammunition. We're at the top of the old control tower at the Naval Air Station in Sitka. Behind me you can see the, uh, the tarmac where all the planes would line up. There's two main hangars that were built here. There's a third actually on the other side of the island. Well, people were very apprehensive here. I was sitting on the swing on my girlfriend's front porch. We figured that eventually we would get into it. We were concerned about the Japanese expanding as they were. I was in Juneau with my parents, and um, they didn't have a radio. I could still remember getting the news of a shortwave receiver I had. When her dad came out and announced. Somebody came by and told my dad. And I remember one Sunday evening, we were listening to radio, and my grandma was absolutely shocked. Pearl Harbor was being attacked. Pearl Harbor had been bombed. Pearl Harbor had been bombed. That's how I and at that first day of the, of the war, the Navy went out here with the fast boats and machine guns and shot out all the lights, all the navigation lights were shot out. Because they didn't want to give any Japanese planes any indication of how to get in and out of, of Sitka. I had already left here, and I was uh, stationed at Kodiak, and we immediately went out and put our searchlights up. I was in a searchlight battery. But after I realized the impact of what had happened in Pearl Harbor, we were just devastated. At that time, I didn't decide anything. I was working for my father. So the United States is in the middle. The United States is looking at a two-front war. We came back up to Alaska. Several times that we were alerted that there was an attack coming. And we had to get our windows all blacked out and uh, curtains, heavy curtains. They used to tell me that during the blackout period that they shut all the lights off in the city area and all the lights on the islands would turn on. If there was ever a bombing raid, then they'd bomb out there and not here. We were never sure what was going to happen. I had to get up at 6 a.m. to practice my piano. And of course, I had the light on in the living room. Got this knock on the door, and I don't remember if it was home guard or if it was military, but they said, ma'am, there's light showing through your window. You turn it off, please. I, I certainly remember having bad dreams about heading to the woods uh, when we were going to be attacked. I had to go down to Pittsburgh to enlist. I wanted to be a pilot. I'd never flown, I'd been in an airplane up to that point, but. That's what I wanted to do. Why Sitka? Well, Sitka is sort of the obvious place. The defense of the Northwest would depend throughout the war on logistics. But Alaska was going to be the most significant player in world air power because of its location. Civilian contractors could not work fast enough for the Navy, so the Navy created these uh, Naval Construction Battalions, or Seabees as they were known. From January 1942 until the end of 1943, 
300 different military installations are, are constructed in Alaska. That's how big this operation was. When the Army arrived, they found that the Navy had essentially taken over all of Chaponsky Island. So they leveled Alice and Charcoal Island, and that was going to be Fort Ray, which was a garrison for the U.S. Army troops. That wasn't enough room. The first thing that happens, of course, is fortification. The officers in charge of planning the harbor defenses of Sitka identified Maknadi Island as being one of the best spots to put guns. They decided they'd take the uh, seven little islands between Japonski and Maknadi and level them and use them for additional garrison space. The ammunition magazines, harbor defense radio station for long distance communication, many barracks, the motor pools. It was, in its heyday, a 8,100 foot causeway, two lane jeep track that spanned depths greater than 70 feet between Krishkin and Maknadi Island. Maknadi Island was described by a coast artillery officer who came to visit as a quintessential seacoast fort. Every inch of it was used. You have the six inch gun battery at the top of the island, and that's got two six inch guns uh, 210 feet apart. You have a central traverse magazine between them that uh, is a tunnel 144 feet long with rooms and targeting facilities, a power plant, gas proofing, so they kept part of, the, part of it with scrubbed air and under pressure in case it was a gas attack, all underground. The Navy would identify the vessels and then the Army would shoot at them if need be. The causeway alone cost $2 million to get that built in 1940s money. The Naval Air Station in Sitka required a lot of extra facilities for navigation and, and support. Um, one of these was a radar, an air surveillance radar. This was top secret work. Harbor Mountain was one of the first attempts on using radar. When the Navy arrived in Sitka and they, they got wind that they could have this state-of-the-art radar installation, they quickly decided that Harbor Mountain would be a great spot to put it. It gets you up high enough that you can have long range, you can see out over the islands around town. They put that road up there under extremely difficult situations. They ended up hauling rock for over a year. There was, there was quite a bit of urgency initially during the construction efforts. There was a, an accident early in 1941 where they were on Japonski Island, right where the causeway was going to join, and they were blasting away this rock cliff. The charge went off early before they, they cleared the site, and six civilian contractors got buried by the rock and died. Uh, there was one soldier sleeping in the headquarters' first tents. And he heard this explosion and felt the ground shake and he got out of bed and he ran over to the door and was looking around when he heard this whoomp. And they went back in, there was a rock the size of a, of a man's head went through his bed right where he had been sleeping. It was a good thing he got up quick because that rock just had to go about a half a mile. A few months after that, in October, there was a fire. A grass fire on the far side about where the airport is now. Uh, may have started from a cigarette but could have been sabotaged. They had a, a dynamite stored in a small wood house. All the uh, dynamite for the construction efforts. And the wind was blowing towards that, that dynamite dump. Captain Allen was the Army fire chief and they drove up in the Army fire truck with two firemen and they were standing by the fire truck when the Navy Fire Department came racing to try to put out the fire. One of the senior officers saw what was happening and he called the lieutenant in charge and said, don't spray, stop the spraying, stop the spraying, it's going to blow up. But the lieutenant said it's his job to put out the fire and the officer jumped in his jeep and raced back off and, and a, a minute and a half later the dynamite exploded. blew and killed all of the firefighters that were there. Six men died in that blast, including 
uh, four men from the U.S. Army fire station. A rock flew a half mile across the island and killed a Marine who was standing sentry duty over here. And a, uh, another soldier on sentry duty also died. They broke every window in town on the facing that way. Uh, had a 70 foot wide crater that was 30 feet deep. And Captain Allen disappeared. The only thing they found to identify him by was the waistband of his trousers had his laundry number on it. There were other construction accidents, uh, some murders and a few suicides that happened during that time as well. It was uh, a very stressful time for all involved. Pearl Harbor happened December 7th, 1941, and at that point, the Naval Air Station was fully operational. They had gun emplacements on almost all the islands, all the way out to Bjork and on the cruise off all the way to the, the point out there. Soldiers were everywhere. All branches of military were here. Some say 5,000, I've heard 10,000. I don't think it was that amount of people, but it seemed like it to us in a small town. My best guess is there were somewhere around 4,000 people here at any one time. A lot of folks moved through. Um, the construction battalion was comprised of a few hundred guys. Well, I was a carpenter's mate. After you were transferred to that yeah. harbor, you worked on boats. Yeah. That ramp down there is a seaplane ramp from World War II. The PBYs would drive right up that ramp. The water was our, our landing strip. If they're going on a mission, they go in the water and they start up their engines and they just start heading north to take off. If you could believe it, if you understand how slow a PBY is, it could stay up in the air for a long, long, long time. And that's what it had to do. At least four Navy aircraft disappeared during the war years on patrol, crashed or were never found. There was a crash north of town in Sukhoi Inlet that killed General Upshur, he was the commander of the Marine Corps in the Pacific that also killed Charles Paddock, who was the fastest man in the world. The Americans were very successful in breaking many of the Japanese communications codes. They knew that something was coming directed toward Alaska. And it came. One carrier went up to, into the Aleutians and bombed Dutch Harbor. Bombing and strafing Dutch Harbor. Why Dutch Harbor? Well, Dutch Harbor was going to be the major port. Shortly after that, the fleet went into Kiska and Atu Island. The Japanese invaded and took possession of its Atu Island and Kiska Islands. Ultimately, they had more than 5,000 troops spread between those two islands. And the reason that they did that was to try to force the United States to defend its homeland, to defend home territory. The U.S. Navy did not, did not fall for that diversion that the Japanese had hoped that they would. So the military decision on Atu and Kiska and the whole Alaska thing was, we can't do anything more for the time being. What we have to do now is take care of Midway Island. The Battle of Midway Island was, was a revolutionary battle. The, the opposing forces never saw one another. It was all fought from aircraft carriers and airplanes fighting each other in the air. And the United States prevailed because it didn't succumb to the temptation to defend its homeland, to defend home territory. There were natives living on those islands. The Japanese gathered them all up and sent them to Japan. Bad things were happening in the uh, Aleutian chain. The natives on some of the other islands that they thought the Japanese would occupy were evacuated and sent down to a uh, bay close to Juneau. There was a big cannery there and they had barrack buildings and they put up the natives in those. Through that first winter, an awful lot of them perished. The Japanese prisoners of war and German prisoners of war were treated better than they were. 
and it's a shame because they were American citizens. Probably they would all die if some of our Clinka people hadn't helped provide them with food and clothes. because of the naval installation here. Submarines operated up and down that sea corridor all during the war. It was never interdicted by the Japanese. My wife said that a Japanese miniature submarine uh, came down the channel here in Sitka. A good friend of mine who lives here has said that, that she was terrified. As far as I know, there was never a submarine sighted. It probably didn't happen. There were lots of probings, but they, they never stopped any traffic. And Sitka plays a huge role in that. In May 1943, the United States and Canada combined launch a major attack on Attu Island, the Battle of Massacre Bay. It, it was cold, it was muddy, it was wet. But a combined Canadian-American force of 14,000 prevailed. But it was a very costly battle. As a matter of fact, it had one of the highest casualty rates of any single battle. It was a very high casualty rate for any battle the United States fought in World War II. In 1943, the Naval Construction Battalion got sent out in the uh, islands of Attu and Kiska, which had been recently liberated. Kodiak and Dutch Harbor both were operational bases. However, Sitka's was the only one that was anywhere near completion. And from that point on, uh, for all practical intent and purposes, war is over for Alaska. I went back to high school, and he joined the Navy. And he just went over to the Naval Air Station and joined the Navy. Right there in Sitka? Right yeah. there in Sitka, yes. Well, Pearl Harbor was in December of 41, and I got to sit in June of 42. He had just turned 19 when we got married, and I was 17 and a half. <laughs> so. But I had more growing up, growing up to do than she did. <laughs> I'm basically a single mother until, or a single woman, or a married single woman. Um, until Chuck came home in 45. And um, I did graduate from high school, and then I had a baby girl in the following January. It's hard to imagine what life would have been like for these, these soldiers and sailors in cities down south find themselves in Sitka in the fall, winter, and spring when it rains so much and it's just nasty, wet weather. What are you going to do? It was the kind of thing that for soldiers, war often degenerates into. Sitting around with not a lot to do, hoping for three things. C cigarettes, dry socks, and some time off. And that's pretty much Alaska's war after 1943. You had a uh, obligation to entertain those fellows, to keep them happy. So every Sunday, we would go out the boat with them, let them fish and feed them, or invite them to the house. They loved being away from the base. We would go over and bowl sometimes over there and see a movie over there at times. They showed a ton of movies and have a different movie every night. Entertainers would come through. Ingrid Bergman and Joe E. Brown came to Sitka. If the guys weren't busy working, they would get shore leave, they take the shore boat across, go to the bars. Uh, one soldier talked about the girly places up the hill. Oh yeah, up by Swan Lake. A very busy place. My friend Pauline and I would ride our bicycles and it was like, okay, I think I know what that is for. But it was, yeah, they, it was a very busy place and that was legal at that time. So, and these ladies would come down to our store because mom had put jewelry in by that time. They were quite the women. <laughs> There's pictures of some of the guys with uh, an eagle that they've tamed. They had dogs or uh, pet deer. A lot of the guys went hunting. Some of the men built boats. And then we also had uh, really great dances. Locals would be invited to come. 
All the women were invited to go to the, to the USO and dance with the soldiers and talk and, to the men. And, and sailors. Uh, and sailors, yes. Because we had the Mostly sailors. big Navy days here, yeah. too. They had some wonderful musicians there, oh my gosh. I mean, like Artie Shaw, Glenn Miller, Benny Goodman. If you showed up to one of these dances, you were never sitting down because there were all these guys who needed a dance partner. And they'd have dances way at the end of the causeway. A jeep would take us out, we girls would go over. My sisters and I had formed a trio, and so they wanted us to sing at different times. And we sang there, and they had bands, and then we did some recording. Bugle Boy. That was a popular one. There were others. We had quite a repertoire. But they had developed the first radio station, I think, out in that area, too. One time, a bunch of us were invited to go out to Bjorka Island, and we went out on an army tugboat, and the guys out on Bjorka didn't see women very often. So we were really wined and dined. We went to dinner, and uh, then we had a dance, and, and that was quite something. I remember in high school, uh, the boys were not too excited about these, all these military men around. But a lot of our boys enlisted right away. Yeah, and uh, I was very proud of them. We looked at the yearbooks from back during the war, and you'll see just pictures of the ladies there. All the guys had joined the military. They all went off to war. The guys that stayed behind and were still in school and still too young to go, learned an awful lot of basketball and baseball from the competed against the military. If you talk to some of the locals in town, they still talk about what a uh, fantastic time that was for Sitka sports. At that time, they didn't have a basketball coach, so they learned from who they played. They talked about the athletes that were in the military and how they stopped and helped teach them some of the things. But they learned an awful lot. They would all come over here and play baseball over here in, in, in our town. The, uh, 22nd Naval Construction Battalion was very well known for its baseball team. They had members of the Detroit Tigers taking leave from baseball to be part of the unit. As a mother, I had to find a babysitter and come home and cook dinner after I got off work and I had to take care of my child and I think that I did pretty much what I would have done if whether the war was on or not. Walking down the street and pushing my daughter in her stroller I would go down onto the old Russian dock and look across at the island and to my right I would see the hangars where the naval planes were. Every morning the planes would go out on patrol. In the evening at dusk they would also go out again. So that was a part of the life every day. Some of the guys would go hiking. I've seen pictures of, of the men up on top of uh... Mount Restovia Peak, and it's fun to hike to the same spot, see the same rocks, and think not much has changed, really. Yes, there was a sentinel at that time. It came out three days a week. They gave you the headlines and lots of information about what was going on in town. Who had a baby shower for who, and who was there. And <laughs> church women often put on a tea, and it was very formal and uh, you always dressed up and put on your nylon stockings and your high heels and your white gloves and your hat and went to the teeth. <laughs> so, <laughs> I didn't go. <laughs> no, he was an idiot. <laughs> That's what happened when you went to the teeth. <laughs> The, the thing that was most exciting about learning about World War II in Sitka was being able to do some research, read these old documents, and then dig through the deep, thick brush, sometimes with a machete, and you'd find it. My dad and I kayaked and we found a fire hydrant in the middle of the woods. It's like, wow, you know, there's, there's a, a city here, basically. The more I learned, the more questions I had about things. The construction effort provided a perfect spot for the Mount Edgecombe Tuberculosis Sanitarium. There was a new power plant in town, new waterworks in town, 
the shore boats ran into the 70s when the, the O'Connell Bridge was finally built. There were a lot of buildings that were repurposed in town as well. All those structures are still in use today, which is quite nice to see that things have been used and taken care of. One of the things that didn't dawn on me until almost 50 years after the war was the generals came to our camp and they wanted a coast artillery regiment to go to the Philippines. But we still had a month to go to finish training our privates. So they, they didn't want to wait a month, they wanted them now. So they got a National Guard unit with the same type of weapons and shipped them to the Philippines. And those guys went through the death march that weren't killed. And I come that close to going over to the Philippines. Instead of coming to Alaska, I put in five years of my life in that war. But I come out of it with a whole body, a whole mind, and a whole attitude. And I'm thankful for that. I think the sirens when they went off at different times really scared me. I had no idea what was going to happen or if it would happen. It was very scary when I was little. I still remember some of the war movies because it affected me for a long time. If I had nightmares, it was about bombs dropping and things. And, and uh, I think the, the thing that really brought me to task was when a military that knocked on my door. They were on patrol to see if there was no light peeking out from any, any home. And I thought, wow, this is really serious stuff. I didn't pay too much attention to the world stuff that was going on. I knew it was going on, but I didn't have any memory of it. On Mother's Day this year, my uh, granddaughter-in-law wanted to have a Mother's Day brunch for us. She gathered everything together, did a whole thing. All of us were here. We put the table together. And I'm real blessed that I have three great-grandchildren here. And that makes me proud because I think that's really important. It's, it's good to see the kids develop. Each one with such different personality. Oh my goodness. And so different, each one of them. And uh, I always enjoy those gatherings when we were together. The children are so important. I believe it changed Sitka probably because it was starting to blossom a little bit. To watch the changes that happened in Sitka, kind of amazing to see a time of growing up that the things that we saw and changes that happened. Over the years, we watched Sitka change and grow, and population just kind of exploded. Lots of new people, lots of different things that happened. As one thing came in, another thing came in, surprising to see how it changed. I come to realize that I've gotten old. <laughs> to think about some of those things and how they changed, and realize that time is moving on. Do you remember the day you got released and you came home in 1945? Do you remember? No. You remember coming home? No. I must have. <laughs> I didn't know when Chuck was going to be released from the Navy. He had enough points to get out, but I hadn't heard anything from him and I didn't know when he was coming home. And uh, just kind of waiting day by day to hope he, he would be soon, home soon. And I was at work and he walked into the store where I was and he was home. That must have been exciting. 
Iya gue sih Ya, ya And so uh, I wasn't much good the rest of the day So the person who was there <laughs> said go home <laughs> We had four children and we raised them all here. Living in Sitka has been a delight. It's been a wonderful place to live and I wouldn't want to live any place else. There's absolutely nothing I'd want to change in this latest.